Hey, welcome everybody to Martini's for Scott, a show about winning momentum in life and in business. Happy New Year! How are you? Let's have a let's have a toast. Cheers. That's good to have our first drink together of 2021. Um, I'm shooting this. Uh, I know it's Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's when we're enjoying our drink together. I'm shooting it the day before, however, and this is the first new martinis with scott show of 2021 last week you'll know that i released if you're a subscriber you'll know that i released uh, a keynote address i did with galing uh, wlg a uh, that was done before the holiday and uh it was a show about liquidity uh crises that businesses uh a liquidity crisis that a business might be facing during covid and some some solutions to that and it was done to an actually a audience of bankers as opposed to an audience of uh, borrowers and business owners. So it was a bit of a different perspective. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that show. But it's much better to have a drink together and to be back recording again in 2021. Mm, that's good. So look, at, I might be a little disheveled today. Um, I live in the mountains, as some of you know. And there was a big storm this morning, and the electricity, uh, the power was out um, on and off. And uh, at one time that it went off, I was in the middle of shaving. And so I finished shaving in the dark, and I have clearly missed large patches of my face. And so, um, so there you go. But I hope that the power stays stable for the balance of this show, and, and we can get, this, uh, we can get this, this show out to you. 2021 to start off with a bang eh as us canadians might say and i've been sucked into uh, i got sucked into her for about a maybe a day and a half much longer than i should have been i got sucked into this whole election integrity protests slash riots slash insurrection um, and then the social media takeover of broader human permissible thought where the Googles and YouTubes and Twitter and Facebooks of the world can just throw you out, deplatform you, make it so that you can't communicate with the world at large because of because of what you think. I got sucked into that for a while and I had to definitely shake myself out of that and get back to work. As I saw from Elon Musk. Uh, the other day, maybe on Twitter, when someone mentioned he was now the richest person in the world, I think his uh, quote of a response was, how strange. Well, back to work. And that's what I needed to force myself to do. Hope you're doing the same. Uh, it's a much healthier thing to be doing. So, New Year's, what are your New Year's resolutions? Uh, do you make resolutions for 2021 or for any year? Um, I saw a stat the other day, I think from Rory Vaden, don't hold me to that, but I think it was from him, an author of Take the Stairs or something along those lines, that 18% of uh, people can't even hold a New Year's resolution for one single day, for a full day. You make your resolution, I'm going to do this. Within that same day, you break your resolution. That's uh, you know close to 20% of people. It doesn't surprise me, you know, for me, there's two types of resolution, resolutions that work uh, for me. One would be a, what I call an aim, just a general direction, an unspecific general direction. For years, uh, I told myself at New Year's time that, that uh, you know, this upcoming year, I'm going to be a better person, right? I want to just continually improve as a human being. I'm going to be a better person. I put no specifics to it. I didn't have a plan to become a better person, but I just created in my mind this, this guide post, this general direction of where I want to head. And for me, maybe it doesn't work for you, you're more concrete than that, but for me, um, just having this general idea that I could say to myself, what am I trying to do this year? Oh yeah, I'm trying to be better than I was last year. You know, gave me a sense of energy. And you know, at the end of the day, succeeding in life and business is really is really about energy you should do the things that give you energy and you should not do the things that take energy away we'll talk about that in more depth someday so to me that's one type of re resolution like you, you can't fail on that 
I mean, you could be a worse person, so that would be failing, but it's not objective, it's subjective. And it's a, it's something you're striving, it's a general direction. So unless you purposely sway off course and become a worse person, well, that's not something you're gonna fail on. If, 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 if someone came back and asked you at the end of 2021, or asked me at the end of 2021, did you, did you fail at trying to be a better person? Um, well, maybe the answer is always yes, because who the hell knows, but, but 100% for sure I tried, right? 100%, you tried if you, if you had that sort of resolution. The second type of resolution that works for me is something really specific that is a system, not a goal, okay? So I'll tell you what doesn't work for me or for anybody, which is why 18% of people can't last a day. Uh, the typical New Year's resolution, let's talk about weight. I'm gonna lose 20 pounds. There's a New York, there's a New Year's uh, resolution, maybe also a New York resolution, which is what I was about to say. Uh, I'm gonna lose 20 pounds. Well, that's a depressing uh, resolution. It's it's uh, depressing in this sense. Like it, it's a short term, it's instant gratification. I feel good about losing 20 pounds, but when I, you know, in my head that that's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna lose 20 pounds, and then immediately I feel lighter and I have some instant gratification just saying it out loud, but then what, then what? When I becomes increasingly clear that I'm not accomplishing that, then I have this specific failure um, of, this, of, this, of this goal. Whereas if I turn that into a system, if I don't talk about losing 20 pounds, this is what works for me as a second type of New, Year resolution, New Year's uh, resolution, turn into a specific system, which is that I will get up in the morning at this time and I'll work out every day, okay? The, the result of doing that might be that the person loses 20 pounds or that I lose 20 pounds, but what I would focus on is the system and not the goal. That's really specific. You know tomorrow whether you failed to do that and how you're going to remedy that failure. Um, it, it's an action plan. It's not an objective. So for me, I like the really grandiose, broad aims. I like the specific systems, either one. Um, and I, I just shy away at all times from, from you know, objectives like I'm going to lose 20 pounds or I'm going to hit revenue growth of 22.4% this year uh, because they're just wrought with failure. So the other day, as many of you know, cheers again, by the way, as many of you know, I have a young daughter. She's seven years old going on. She's seven going on 17. And uh, this might have been last week or the week before, I don't recall. But she's, you know, she's she's more and more going into her room to do special projects on her own. And she'll go in and she'll shut the door. And, I, wanna, I you know, as a parent, I just want to make sure everything's okay. So... When I notice that, I give her some time and then I go knock on the door and I say, hey, how's it going? What are you up to? And the other thing she started doing is she started, you know, writing, um, you know, so she has paper and pen or paper and pencil. And she's writing things down, writing sentences. She likes to write books. She writes to write notes. She likes to write this and that. And so she says, well, I have started uh, a new project and it's a list of how to change the world. Um, and this is part of a larger global project. She explained to me that she intends to release this to the world in the near future, and uh, that'll save the planet and change the world. And so she started writing out her list to get her thoughts together on that. I don't know where this came from, but, but cool, okay. So what's on your list, darling? Well, so far we have uh, walked to school. This was last week or two weeks ago when I'm talking to her about this. She's like, don't drive to school, you should walk to school. Maybe take the bus sometimes. No plastic cups, turn the lights off when you leave the room. Plant trees would be a good thing to do. Turn water off when you're brushing your teeth. Okay, so that was kind of her list when we were talking about it, I think since she added you know, in, in including walking and driving, she said, take a bicycle. So we've got more to the list. And, you know, I, I said, wow, this is really, I'm impressed. This is really good stuff. And uh, again, I don't know where this comes from because I'm the very first person. If I have to go half a mile or a quarter of a mile down the road, I'm jumping in my big pickup truck with a plastic cup full of coffee with all of my lights on that I could possibly have. Uh, I did not create this list and she's not getting inspiration uh, from me, I'm sorry to say. 
So we talked about the list and she said, you know, I'm stuck. And she was really frustrated. She was trouble coming up with more points <clears throat> in addition to the points that she already had written down on her list, written pretty well, by the way. So dad, that's me, goes into advice mode. And what sort of advice would I give? What sort of advice would you get? give? And I said, you know, I said, if you want to change the world, if you want to have positive change, you need to focus on the things that you can control and you need to have an aim. You need to start, you need to know where you want to go, right? And then you need to start small with specific systems, as we talked about with New Year's resolutions. Uh, so you want a system, not a goal, and you want to focus on the things that you can control first. That's the whole reason this show is called Winning Momentum. Start small, have a win, grow from there. So how do you change the world? Well, you start by changing yourself, right? You start small. You start by changing yourself. And when you've got that, you, you turn to your family and then your community, and maybe your, which could be your school or your town, you know, and eventually you're going to gain momentum and you can change the world. But you have to start with yourself. And how do you start with your small self? How do you change yourself? How do you become a better person? Well, you need to start small uh, and controllable, and you need to have a sense of, of winning, of getting some momentum on change and improving your environment. I was having this discussion with her, didn't give her all the background, but I was thinking this and having this discussion with her while sitting in her room, which was a mess, is always a mess on her completely unmade bed with eight million stuffies on it. And I said to her, you know, one thing you could do and put on the list is make your bed. Make your bed and clean your room. You know, Carl Jung, uh, uh, I think it was Carl Jung, uh, gave us the idea that a cluttered environment and a cluttered mind are the same thing. It's not a clubber, cluttered environment that creates a cluttered mind. It's not a cluttered mind that creates a cluttered environment. It's all the same thing. Your environment is your mind. This is why there's a whole school of psychology that'll tell you, if you want to change your life, you need to start with making your bed in the morning. I'm not an expert on psychology, uh, but I fully buy into this. Again, it's picking something small, having a success, building momentum of that success. Uh, so I say to my daughter, you could make your bed. That's where you could start. And when you're done with that, you'll be so excited and so proud of yourself when you've done that every morning and turned it into a habit, then you can move on to something else. And eventually, before you know it, you will have changed the world in a positive way. I like that advice. Good martinis. My daughter, on the other hand, stared at me. And you could see her thought process. She could see her mind crunching away on this. She stared at me for an uncomfortable amount of time. I mean, maybe it was only 10 seconds, but it felt like 10 minutes. And finally, she looked at me and she said, I'm going to come up with different ideas. You're fired from this job. Get out of my room. <laughs> That's my seven-year-old for you. Most people come in. I have somebody at the door. I'm talking about you on a show. Hmm. Well, maybe we'll talk after, okay? Yeah. All right. There's my daughter right now coming into the middle of the show. Uh, most people, most people have resolutions, goals, plans that are outside of their control. They're seeking instant gratification. Most businesses, certainly the ones that are in trouble are not performing well, have budgets that are outside of their control um, to a large extent, are not focused on systems instead of where specifically they're going to end up. Is it more exciting in your mind? When I talk about instant gratification, is it more exciting in your mind to have, to say, I'm going to lose 20 pounds? Or is it more exciting in your mind to say, I'm going to get up early every single day this year and I'm going to work out? Which one's more interesting to you? The instant gratification is I'm going to lose 20 pounds. The, the system that will be successful is the hard work is that I'll get up every morning and and work out every day. So it's the start of the new year. How are you going to change the world? What are you going to focus on? What is your aim? What is your new system? Because you need 
you want to make change, you need to know where you're going, more or less, that's the aim, and you need to have, you need, to, you need a new system, by definition, right? You want to make more money in your business, you need to change something, by definition. You want to change your life, you need to change something, by definition, that's a new system. What are you going to do? Let's talk about aim for a second. We'll talk about both of these points, uh, or maybe I've hammered home the system enough already. You know, when we talk about aim, I want you to, it, it's people I find struggle this when I rate with this issue when I raise this point. Picture yourself lost in a forest. You're, you're just in the middle of nowhere. You have no idea where you want to go. Well, you know where you want to go. You want to go home or you want to find your car in the parking lot or whatever the case may be, but you have no idea where that is. Okay. And if you look in the horizon, let's say you've got a north, south, east, west. A peak, a mountain peak, or a hill peak, or something that you can guide yourself to so that you're not getting lost, sort of uh, trying to follow the moss on the right hand side of the tree. And so, yeah, you, you, yeah, you're able to pick a direction and stick to it. Is that direction right? You don't know because you're lost. <laughs> you don't know where you're supposed to be. You don't know which way you're supposed to go. But if you don't pick a direction, if you don't say, okay, I'm going to head to that peak or I'm going to head to this one to the east, you don't know which north, south, and east is, but I'm going to head to this one on the left. If you don't pick a direction and stick with it until it doesn't feel right, then you're never going to get out, right? Can you picture that in your head? Because if you walk aimlessly and never go in the same direction, how are you ever going to get out of the predicament? You have to have a general direction. You have to use your gut. Right? You do all the research you can. You go, you go back, when you're lost in the forest, you go back, I kind of went this way, I went that way, and maybe I think in, I think, I think my car or my home is, is in direction. And, and that's my gut feel. I think I should go in that direction. I'm gonna head towards that peak over there. Well, that's what you need to do. You have to have an aim, because if you don't have an aim, you're not gonna go anywhere. You're never gonna solve the problem. And you go in that direction until that direction is not working for you. You run into the ocean in that direction, or you run into a major cliff or something that you just know for a fact shouldn't be there. Well, you were wrong. Was that a waste of time? No, it was not a waste of time because, because now you only have three options instead of four options, right? So you go back and you try again, and you do it in a different direction. That's what I'm talking about when I say you need an aim, okay? The aim is not, I'm gonna be back to my house by 3.30 p.m. That's not the aim. The aim is I wanna head in this particular direction. If you don't, if human, human beings cannot function without a sense, of, uh, a sense of direction, it's the aim that lets you know how to allocate resources, including time. Um, it's what serves as a guide to decision making. Where are you going? If you can't answer that question, you're not going to make any changes in the new year, in your life, in your business. You're not going to make any changes ever if you don't have a general sense of direction. And by the way, you don't need to be right, as we just discussed. Okay, here's what Sinclair Range, my primary company, is aiming at in 2021. I was working with rules of three, by the way, so I keep my list short because I just believe that, you know, if you have more than three points on anything, you know, it just loses reality in the human brain. You can have sub points under them, you know, one or two sub points under each point, but but I keep my list to three. If I'm really pressed, I'll, I'll, I'll change it to five. Uh, but my three points for Sinclair range, which means my business, it means uh, all the businesses that I'm involved with, uh, number one, I want to add to my investment portfolio with at least one acquisition this year. If you're a follower of the show, you know that we own uh, Roofers World. Um, we have some other portfolio investments I haven't talked about yet. Uh, we bought Novani Stainless, a sink manufacturer, in June of 2020. And, uh, you know, a major aim of mine, just a direction, is I want to add to that portfolio uh, in 2021. I want to build on my knowledge that I've gained in 2020 and double down my efforts on digital brand building and online sales, all right? Because I started 2020 as a complete ignorant twit with respect to those things uh, because I'm old, right? I didn't grow up with this stuff like some of you younger viewers did. I need to learn. And one of the things that I love at my age is continuing to learn, continuing to explore, continuing my journey. And I just think this is one of the most important things that I could be doing.
excuse me, for all of my businesses. Following a year of too much chaos, this is my third item. Following a year of too much chaos. And by chaos, I mean, in January 2020, we changed our mission at Sinclair Range from an advisory services company into an acquirer um, of, of troubled businesses, fixing them up, lending to them, being an owner. Um, we had turnover in our staff. As a result, we got hit with COVID. We bit off a big chunk uh, in Navani Stainless. Um, and we, we, we did not have, we were not bulletproof on our own housekeeping coming into this year. And so there's just been a lot of chaos. There's a lot of just been putting out fires and running. It's all positive. I'm not complaining about this by any stretch. We've had the best year by far, uh, that we've had. We just, every year, every year for years has been better than the last year. And 2020 is no exception. I doubt 2021 is going to be an exception to that, but a focus on this year is a little more order and a lot less chaos. We're gonna focus on what I'm calling housekeeping, uh, which is which is internal controls and, and reporting and you know uh, uh, government submissions, like all this stuff that I think has just been sloppy and we need to catch up on because of our, our rapid growth. That's where I'm aiming this year. Again, those are not specific Okay, those are not specifics. I haven't said specifically, this is what I want to accomplish with my digital brand building. It's not what I've accomplished with my housekeeping, but it's given me a general direction. Um, and what it's allowed me to do is it's allowed me to sit down and say, okay, what is the system that I could put behind this? And I've allocated time to that system on my schedule. And with the housekeeping, for example, I, I've literally put on my schedule that I will spend 30 minutes a day. It's just a recurring item on my Microsoft to-do list, which used to be Wonderlist, which was a much better app, but you know, everything gets bought at the end of the day and made worse. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, my Microsoft to-do with a recurring, uh, with, with a recurring daily item, I spend 30 minutes a day on housekeeping and housekeeping could be anything I want. Okay. Right. So it's cleaning up the server, it's trying to get my expense reports done. It's looking at uh, insurance policies. Like it's all that sort of crap that if you're running full steam, you forget to take a look at. And that's it. I've created a name and I've created a system. And it shocks me. It has shocked me how productive I've been on that particular aim already. And it's only January 14th while we're having this drink. Uh, so that's been, that's been pretty cool. So that's what I'm doing. What are you doing? Let's uh, let's uh, switch topics here a little bit, switch gears, but it, it kind of hits home on the same point. So uh, last week, well, it was January 4th, um, there was an announcement that, sorry, this just makes me laugh, this whole thing. There was an announcement that Google engineers um, have started a union. Did you see that? I think it was sort of lost in the Trump election fraud, uh, uh, you're a tyrant trying to have an insurrection and with all that sort of news and chaos, this was lost a little bit. It was exciting for about an hour and then it got superseded. The Google union. So I, I was just laughing. Let me talk to you about um, investment banking for a minute. We'll come back around to the Google thing. So I, I looked this up, I did a quick Google search, even though I knew off the top of my head uh, kind of where this was gonna end up. What do you think the, at, not the average, the starting salary, the average starting salary of an investment banker is um, coming right out of school. So you come right out of school, you join an investment bank, the average salary, uh, according to the research that I saw, was $95,000 as a base, as a base, but in an investment bank, you can also Google this, um, you know, your, your average bonuses, if there's a decent year by the bank, would be 50 to 100% 50 to of your base, so let's say on average, you come out of school, you join a decent investment bank, and you're gonna expect in year one to put $150,000 in your pocket. Now that's not a little boutique investment bank necessarily, um, certainly not ours, but, um, but if you join one of the big banks in the investment banking practice, maybe you've had a year or two experience you joined into there, you're gonna get, you're gonna expect, say that $150,000 um, as a starting as a starting salary. 
Does that sound like a lot of money to you? What is the average U.S. income? These are U.S. numbers that I'm using. What is the average U.S. income uh, for an individual? Well, I looked that up as well. And in 2017, which was the most recent stat I, I saw, and I'm sure it's not going to change very much, the average per person U.S. income, not a starting salary, an average. So what does that mean? That means you're probably 40, 45, and halfway through your career. The average salary in the U.S. is $35,977 in 2017. Your starting salary as an investment banker will be about 150 grand, which is 300, 350% more than the average 40 year old fellow or lady uh, working at a job in the US. 300 to 350% more for a kid coming out of school. Do you think that's normal then to make that much money? Do you think it's normal to make 150,000 in your first job? Or do you think you made a bargain? You made a bargain that you traded something for that amount of money and if so, what did you trade? Did you trade maybe your dreams? Did you trade your soul? Did you trade your soul for cash? Right? I would suggest to you that you traded uh, all of those things. You traded your soul in particular. I've gone through this path, okay? I took a bit of a side path to get to where I am, but I know enough. I've worked enough in investment banking and I've owned enough in corporate finance houses and boutique firms. I, I know I've hired investment bankers. I know how this works. Um, and I will tell you, I will tell you that you have sold your soul. Maybe people don't want to hear that, but that's the trade that you made. When I started at, uh, I started at KPMG in the corporate finance valuation group, which is an accounting firm's version of, uh, um, investment banking, you don't get the same pay. When I tell people, when I started there, I worked seven days a week. I worked from 9, 9.30 in the morning uh, because I'm not an early riser until probably three in the morning every single day for years, years I did that. And then when I left, uh, which was in 1994 and I started my own uh, my own uh, entrepreneurial firm in corporate finance, um, mostly doing venture capital type broker deals. Uh, but as an advisor, as an intermediary, the same type of service, I probably did three all-nighters a week. Okay, so I would put in tons of hours on the non-all-nighters, uh, but I probably did three all-nighters a week. I had a guy uh, join me as a partner in that firm, Merchant Capital, who... Uh, was the former Wall Streeter. He was the former head of, uh, uh, he was a founding partner at Dylan Reed and Wasserstein Perella. Maybe not Dylan Reed. He was a head trader at Dylan Reed. I, I forget the resume. Head trader at Dylan Reed and founding partner at Wasserstein Perella. Don't hold me to that. But, you know, in the 1980s, heyday Wall Street, uh, this guy was a player with million dollar bonuses, which was a lot of money in the 1980s. And uh, he joined as a full partner at my firm, uh, Merchant Capital. And he was a decade older than me, which uh, at least, which means that he would have been early 40s, 45, and you know, we were partners until his 50s. And he did, he did at that age, three all-nighters a week um, at the same time, okay? You put in the hours, that is the work ethic required. And um, there's no, none of this life balance stuff as my father used to tell me, balance is bullshit, and I think, that's pretty good advice and I think it's a, it's reality in life. You spend your hours on what you choose to do and if you choose to take the money that we're talking about, then you better be choosing to put in those hours because that's what's required. So you've sold your soul on your time, for sure. You're not doing good for the world, okay? Um, I've evolved my practice into focusing on saving jobs, all right? So we try to rescue troubled companies and the good in that that I see is saving jobs. It took me a long time to understand that. It took me decades, potentially, to get to the point where I thought, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can take my experience and I can do good with that. But when I was in my 20s and my early 30s and even into my 40s, I wasn't thinking that here's the good in what I do. I was thinking about this was a trade. I can go in, I can do this, I can make a bunch of money, 
right? It was never on my, I wasn't thinking social agenda. I wasn't trying to save the planet. I was doing, I had my head down and I was working. And by the way, if you're working from 9.30 to 3 a.m., seven days a week, there's not a lot of time for reflection to save the planet or have a social agenda. There just isn't, okay? That's that's a reality. Try it sometime. So you've you've given up, if you take this bargain, you've given up, you know, these grandiose ideas that you might have when you're younger about changing the world, as my daughter has this idea about changing the world. And I, I'm not trying to take it away from her. I'm just saying you can't do both, right? You can't take, you can't make that bargain and then and then expect to have and expect to have a social agenda, for example, at the same time, which is kind of where all this is heading, by the way. So you've made that, you're, you're not doing good that maybe you wanted to do. You're abusing substances, like nobody can keep that up without drinking or the new thing nowadays, uh, particularly on the West Coast would be uh, psilocybin, psilocybin uh, microdosing, uh, amphetamines, like whatever people are taking to keep their energy level up. Um, it's rampant. It's rampant, like the whole, the whole industry is, it's just epidemic throughout that. You know, my biggest fear when I was 25 to, to 30 is wandering around Bay Street, which is the Canadian version of Wall Street, and looking at the 40 year old, 45 year old, hardcore, ultra successful drunks that were just embarrassing and unhealthy, and many of whom dropped dead. And I was just so scared about turning into that person, which, you know, thankful, thankfully uh, for me, I never, I never got into that position, but you see it all the time. You see it all the time. And that's part of the bargain you made for that cash. You're probably an asshole. You probably turned into an asshole uh, because of the bubble that you lived in. You've become money centric. Uh, that is your value is how much money am I making? What is my bonus gonna be? What is this next trade doing for me? Um, that's what you turn into. I remember, I love a story from uh, Warren Buffett, the value investor, uh, about buying into a investment bank, a New York investment bank, a, a big one, I forget which one, uh, but he bought it when it was troubled or whatever, and then, and then he sold it really shortly after that. And he said, I, I don't understand these people. He says, I just don't understand people. He says, when times are bad, when times are good, they want more money, these investment bankers. They all want more money when times are good because we're making more money and so they want bigger and bigger bonuses. And when times are bad, they want more money so they don't leave to the other shop, right? There's no scenario where they don't want more money. And he said, I just can't, I can't understand this business. I'm out, these people are too greedy. They're not good people. He's right, it made me laugh when he said that because he's he's dead on. You know what else is interesting about you if you took that job and you're in that environment is all that money you're making, you didn't save any of it. You didn't save it because you're out drinking, you're out eating, you're wearing expensive suits, you're trying to keep up with the Joneses. I'm not sure that saying there's not the odd exception, but for the most part, you think you're God, you think you're better than everybody else, you think you're smarter than everybody else, and you're gonna always make this amount of money. Not that you're like an athlete with a three, four year life cycle. You're not thinking that way. You're thinking I'm building this career and this is always the way it's gonna be. And so you don't save any of that money. And on this idea of you, you think you're better than everybody else. I mean, it's self-fulfilling, right? I mean, you got this job. The other guy didn't get the job. You got the job. You're the one making 150 grand out of school. And, and it just fulfills, it, it just, uh, justifies and and stokes this impression that you're the smart one that you're the smart one you remember the movie uh, uh, Wall Street the original Wall Street with Charlie Sheen and a bunch of other great actors and Charlie Sheen's character Bud Fox you know he starts off a naive high integrity um, um, stockbroker um, in the industry in New York and then he makes some bad ethical decisions uh, chasing the buck gets hooked up with uh, Gecko, uh, the bad guy in the movie. And at one point, he's made a ton of money as a new apartment. He's got Daryl Hannah as a girlfriend, and she's moved in. And um, he's holding this drink and he's looking out the window over Manhattan and seeing all the lights at night in a reflective moment in the movie. And he says to himself out loud, Who am I? 
who am I? Right? Because he's lost touch with himself. And at that point in the movie, everything starts to kind of go negative for him. Um, because he, he, he he's he's finally figured out, he's pointed, he's finally figured out, and the rest of the audience of this movie now realizes that he just gave away, he gave away everything. He sold his soul uh, for the cash, which is what the job's about. And every movie, every movie that you see about Wall Street and bankers, it's all the same movie. When you think about it, look at The Wolf of Wall Street. The guy starts off, he's trying to support his family, and then he just turns into a crazy person, not just for the money, but for the lifestyle, right? For the, for the sex and drugs and rock and roll and the cash that comes along with it. And either you have an epiphany, epiphany um, and correct yourself, or, or the regulatory bodies or the world at large does it for you, right? And, and that's what happened in both of those movies with both of those characters, The Wolf of Wall Street and Bob Fox in Wall Street. Um, so, I mean, there's a reason the movies tell that storyline over and over again is my point. That is the trade that you made if you took that job. And now, why would you take that job? Well, if you can keep your soul, like if you can understand that this is what's going on and you can make the money, you can do something positive with it, like save it and set yourself up for something in the future. Um, if you can learn, if you can work, when you're in your 20s, you should be working 24 seven, uh, 18 hours a day. And if you wanna be successful, in life and in business and you should be using that opportunity to learn you should learn the, t the technical side of your business uh, you should learn how to be a professional you should learn a work ethic that there's a direct correlation between work and success right if you can have that perspective if you can have an exit plan then this this type of job could be a really positive thing and you know why do you get that big a paycheck apart from selling your soul well it's because of course the banks make a lot of money and why do they make a lot of money? Well, two reasons. One is they've created an economic uh, and regulatory structure that ensures that they're gonna make a lot of money. Do you think that the regulatory organizations are set up to protect investors first and foremost? Or maybe they're set up to protect the bank first and foremost, not the little banks, the big banks first and foremost, uh, within reason. They create an environment that allows the banks to charge what they charge, to charge the success fees that they charge, to charge the work fees that they charge. And all of that, all of that makes them super profitable so that they could pay you as a first year, $150,000, three and a half times what the average worker in the US might be making. But it's also because, that's reason number one, they make the money, but it's also specifically because you sell your soul, because you work those hours, because you don't ask too many questions, because you put up with the uh, uh, the sexual harassment that goes on. If you're working, you know, if you're a, a, a young woman and I, I, on this show, uh, in the early days, we had Olga Jelani on a lot, who is a terrific investment banker, um, one of the better analysts that was on the street joined uh, Sinclair Range from there. And, you know, she has really thick skin. She has, like, in terms of not being offended. I think some of that is her upbringing, but a lot of it is in her investment banking experience because it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be pretty if you're working 18 hours a day besides some traders or some other investment banking uh, people who aren't so slick, but maybe pigs in a macho sense. You gotta put up with a lot or you need to leave. Like that's that's the culture and it should change. I'm not saying it should be like that. I'm not saying you should, you should accept it. I'm saying that when you're under that amount of pressure cooker and you're being paid that amount of money, there's a choice. There's a choice, there's a cost to doing that, okay? So here's the bottom line is you made a bargain. If you took that job, you made a bargain, you made a bargain with the devil. Maybe it's not the devil, but there's a decent chance it's the devil and the onus is on you because you made that bargain. What are you going to do about it? Well, there's a lot about investment bankers. Let's talk about these Google engineers and their union. Do you know what the entry level salary is for a Google engineer? According to Google, uh, it's $150,000. It's the exact same as the investment bankers. Uh, $150,000 plus. Again, do we think that's a normal amount of money? Or do we think that maybe they also made a bargain? January 4th, roughly 230 Google employees announced they were forming a union with the Communication Workers of America, 
open to employees and contractors of Alphabet, Google's parent company. Over the past three years, I'm just reading from a press release here. Google's employees have been organizing major walkouts and protests to oppose the company's decision to work with the Pentagon on targeted drone, drone strikes. Paying former executive Andy Rubin $90 million after he was credibly accused of sexual harassment. Designed a censorship search engine for China. Most recently, employees have stood up against Google's, Google's firing of prominent AI ethicist, somebody whose name I can't pronounce. And now the union organizers want to unite all of these efforts under a single umbrella. Uh, and there's a Google walkout Twitter account. I didn't know there was a Google walkout Twitter account. I haven't looked for that. Uh, publicly supported by the Alphabet Workers Union. Now, as I said, that was January 4th. They started with 230 members, which is nothing. It's nothing. It's just a little, not even a blip. They wouldn't even notice if it was that many employees who were unhappy in a, in a company the size of uh, Google. They will notice that it's unionized. That's going to be an issue. And now, here we are a week or uh, 10 days later, they're up to seven, more than 700 members as of last mon Monday. Um, the group, again, is open to Google's parents. Uh, parent company uh, includes workers from 35 offices in the U.S. and Canada. Here's a quote from that press release. YouTube refuses to hold Donald Trump accountable to the platform's own rules by choosing only to remove one video instead of removing him from the platform entirely, this being YouTube. Uh, they wrote the company is avoiding the proactive action called for by both their workers and the broader public. So these are the types of things that the union is taking on. So these employees whose starting salary, not their average salary, their starting salary is about $150,000 are upset by these ethical issues that they're seeing within the company that can afford to pay them $150,000 probably highly correlated with the fact that they're doing these unethical things, at least in the minds of the people that joined the unit, right? Do you see that? Okay, you see that these people made this bargain and now they wanna go back on the bargain. Instead of just leaving, you just say like, you know what? You guys are unethical, I'm gonna, re and here's the reasons why, I'm gonna release this to the press and get some publicity, get some attention for myself, and I'm gonna go do something else. They're not doing that, they're looking change from within the organization, which is cool, totally cool by me. What I find fascinating is the stupidity that they think they can change the organization from within without resistance because the, the company does these things for cash, right? There's a lot of cash in those things that we just talked about. Um, they do it for cash and they think the company's going to change because it's the right thing to do. And then they think if it does change, that they're just going to live in this utopia of making 150 grand coming out of school, whereas the rest of the world's making $35,000. It's insane. It just makes me laugh. So what is this all about? My first reaction, as I said, was to laugh. Or what do we make of all this? I don't know. What do you think? My first reaction was just to laugh. And maybe I have a different perspective than most because of the industry that I, I came from. Uh, it just seems to me that clearly these workers have not bought into the fact that they sold their soul and entered a bargain. Um, and maybe they'll get away with it. Maybe they'll get, like, anything's possible. <laughs> anything's possible. But it seems to me that they think, they think because they're so into their bubble and they have all of the negativities that I described to you with investment bankers from my world, that they think they're the smartest people on the face of the earth. That's why they get paid so much. Uh, and they're chasing the dollar and they think that they're superior. They think they're superior to the rest of the world because they're smarter and that's evidenced by, by their paycheck. And you know what? Maybe they are. Maybe they are smarter than the rest of the world. But are they wiser? How is this going to work out for them? This is not a rant against unions, okay? It's not a rant against Google, although I would have plenty to rant against Google uh, based on their behavior and the other social media companies. But what about these employees? How wise is this? Where is this heading? Um, or is it just is it just such an ego-driven, um, self-indulgent entitlement play 
that it's that is disgusting to the rest of the world it's disgusting to me um, personally and uh, I don't know I don't know I'd be interested in your feedback where do you think that's gonna end up here's a little bit of advice for you if you want to want to make that amount of money as a young professional if you're at a tech firm if you're an investment bank you're in a professional firm you're making an ungodly amount of money there is a cost there is a bargain that you have made understand it the cost you pay is precisely why your firm makes so much money and is able to pay you that if you weren't doing those things they wouldn't make so much money and they wouldn't be able to pay you take responsibility for your life your bargain don't point fingers if if you're unhappy with ethics where you are if you're unhappy with the social direction if you're unhappy with anything it's your responsibility to raise it with your firm but if but if they stick to their guns if they're not making changes and you can't live with it you can't you got to leave you got to find something that is acceptable with your soul or you need to sell your soul your choice I don't think it's a good idea to sell your soul personally I don't think anybody would give you that as being good advice okay but is that's what you see is your option what you cannot do is take all that money think that you're better uh, that you're an elite whereas the rest of the world is not that you're smarter and that you're wiser and that your institution should change to meet your will yet pay you the same amount of money that they hired you for the job uh, that they're paying you for the job that you have to do okay there is the view of an old guy an old school opinion on this i recognize that no millennial is going to have that opinion think about it just think about it walk through the logical consequences of what you're trying to accomplish and and how at the end of the day how the math doesn't work it's just it's it just doesn't work this is the very reason that in my companies i will 100 percent of the time hire a a how do i want to phrase this a street fighter um, someone from a lesser university who's worked hard their whole life who has to huff, hustle who wants to who wants to win and is willing to do what it takes versus an ivy league entitled millennial 100 percent of the time and of course that hustler could be millennial as well i'm not trying to pick on millennials i'm just saying when you've got a bunch of cvs and one of them comes from this place and one of them comes from this place which is by society norms um, a lesser um, status lesser in the power hierarchy lesser in class um, all of those things but this person is is street smart wants to hustle and put the work in that's my person I that's what I support I want to help that person in their career and they're gonna do a better job for me I once had a um, I once hired uh, somebody at Sinclair range I won't give any names and uh, a, a younger individual right out of school with a with a very strong sense of entitlement and it made me laugh uh, so this person was an analyst they have a downtown uh, this was in Toronto this this particular job downtown Toronto job and they had a downtown flat um, not really downtown if you're from Toronto the person lived in little Italy um, whereas the the office uh, you know was downtown on Bay Street so they couldn't quite walk but they could kind of walk or jump on a bus and be there in you know 15 minutes that kind of thing and so we got a, a large file uh, you know for us a really large file that you know was about again if you're tr you know, from Toronto was out in Etobicoke by the airport but if you're not from Toronto it was say you know an hour in the morning we in rush hour an hour and 20 minutes still in the city but Toronto's a big city um, and so okay we're on this file and you know I need you there I need you there five days a week blah 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 and he comes back to me and he says um, and we're doing this by whatsapp messaging <laughs> he comes back to me and he says uh, well I don't have a car you know and putting the onus on me to get him to work now it's true that in our contracts we don't say you know I expect you to show up at 20 Bay Street but if I expect you to show up somewhere else that's my problem that wasn't really clarified it wasn't clarified in our contracts because it never occurred to me that if it was still in Toronto that someone would have a problem going to work at this particular client so he says, well, I can't, uh, I can't do what you're asking me to do because I don't have a vehicle. 
So I said, take the subway. Take the subway. I mean, it's public transportation that heads out there. And um, so we Googled it, did some research on the subway. And he said, well, you know, in the morning, that's an hour and a half. That's an hour and a half for me to get to there. And then it's not, it's not like I'm still 15 minute drive from where this office is. So that's not going to work for me. So we'll take an Uber. Take an Uber or rent a car. He goes, yeah. He says, so are you going to pay for that? Are you going to pay for that Uber? And again, this is all by WhatsApp. And so I wasn't, I didn't know if he was being ironic or being funny or being dead serious, which would have helped me on a phone call. What I was really thinking was I was in my head back to when I was his age at KPMG and me saying to the managing partner, yeah, you know, you're going to have to get me a car or find me some sort of transportation, pay for my taxi back and forth every day. Otherwise, I just can't do it. I don't have a car. Now, what I was wondering about this entitled young fellow is, when he made a decision not to own a car as a young professional, was it his expectation that he would never ever have a transportation expense for the rest of his life? Was that the plan? Was the plan to never ever spend a cent on transportation? Or was it just, I live in the center of a city and I don't need a car very often, so I wanna make this more of a variable cost. His idea was that transportation is not his problem. It's somebody else's problem. That's the way it turned out to be. Uh, we came to a, a compromise that I was not happy with, which is uh, he took the subway to the end of the line and then took an Uber and I paid for that Uber every day uh, twice. But um, that sense of entitlement uh, meant that he didn't last at the firm very long, uh, not very long at all. That is my show for today. Um, thank you for listening. This has been Martinis with Scott. Uh, we are on YouTube. Uh, we also have the audio on the podcast channels on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. See you next week. Again, thank you for listening. If you like it, please subscribe. Happy New Year.